On this week's 51%, oncologist and medical historian Dr. Elizabeth Coleman gives us a lesson on gender bias in early medicine and why women continue to receive inadequate care today. We are not small men. The way that our bodies function is very different from men, and that requires an understanding of diseases that may not occur in men and diseases that have been largely ignored. Dr. Komen also offers up some advice on how to better advocate for yourself with your doctor. I'm Jesse King. It's all up next on 51%. I was standing around like one of those girls I had seen in a movie. The whole world was a movie back then. I had my sunglasses on, I wanted to be seen without seeing Shiloh or Lita, I wasn't really in it I didn't really get it You're listening to 51%, a WAMC production dedicated to women's issues and experiences. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jesse King. We've got a number of episodes on reproductive health, specifically endometriosis, coming down the pipeline for you in the next couple of weeks. But before we embark on that, for the last week of Women's History Month, I thought it would be fun to brush up on our collective medical history. Our guest today is Dr. Elizabeth Komen, an oncologist treating breast cancer patients at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in Manhattan and an assistant professor of medicine at Cornell Medical College. She's also a medical historian. Before graduating from Harvard Medical School and becoming a doctor, she earned her bachelor's in the history of science. She combines the two in her new book, All in Her Head, The Truth and Lies Early Medicine Taught Us About Women's Bodies and Why It Matters Today. As Coleman will tell us, women are not just men with uteruses, and women's health is more than obstetrics and gynecology. But early medicine was largely built around men. And throughout history, doctors have either ignored women's health concerns, treated their bodies as objects, or inflicted their own ideas and biases upon them. With each chapter, Komen tackles a different organ system of the body and explores how medicine has failed and continues to fail women in that area. She says she hopes it will give voice to the many women who have died from being told their pain is, quote, all in their head, and give patients an idea of how to advocate for themselves at their next appointment. I've taken care of thousands of women in my career, again, with breast cancer. I am a woman myself. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. I'm a wife. I care for women in my family. And because of that, I've had sacred relationships with patients, but also deeply personal experiences that have highlighted for me just how much women's diseases are misunderstood, underfunded, at best, at worst, dismissed. Women show up feeling invalidated for their pain, shamed, or even blamed for the way that they feel. And it really just became an overarching theme in my personal life and especially my professional life and what I see with patients. And I wanted to be part of some bigger movement to help the mission towards more equality of care for everybody. And this book was really an effort to look at that. And The reason why the book is structured the way that it is as a walk through women's body by organ system is really to highlight the fact that much of the idea of women's health has been reductionist. The idea that we are reduced to our breasts and our reproductive function when we think about women's health or the field of gynecology. But when in fact, we are not small men, the way that our bodies function is very different from men. And that requires an understanding of diseases that may not occur in men, diseases that may be female predominant and diseases that have been largely ignored. And that is the reason why the book is a walk through women's entire bodies by every organ system, which mirrors the specialties that we know today, like cardiology, gastroenterology and neurology. One chapter that was really interesting to me was your chapter about bones, you know, just the skeletal system, because I think there was a part of me that was like, we all have the same skeletons. How much could there really be to talk about bones? But, you know, it turns out there's a lot to talk about in this whole history where the female skeletal system is like typically depicted in textbooks was not technically correct. Well, I think it really speaks to the idea that we see what we think we want to see. And in much of history, the idea was that women were more frail that women's bodies were of less value, and furthermore, that that we were less intelligent and that our role was really to be vessels. So when you look at some of the anatomical drawings of women's skeletons, when we were even included in textbooks, a lot of the time it was an exaggeration of our skulls to represent more primal animals, whether it was our skulls being smaller because we're less intelligent or disproportionately wider hips. Yes, we have wider hips, but disproportionately so um, to show that this is really our function in life. And there is so much that we can understand by looking at anatomical drawings and understanding what was valued, what was devalued, 
and what was highlighted about our bodies. If you look at the clitoris, for example, that's lost and found many times in anatomical textbooks and at some points just simply ignored. And to bring up your point about skeletons, so much of what we know and don't know relates to a limited understanding of how women's skeletal functions operate, particularly with athletic injuries. When you look at joint injuries that are more predominant in women, whether it's frozen shoulder, which is a condition more predominant in women where their shoulders can freeze. And the history of treating that was something called benign neglect, where basically, you know, you just ignore it and eventually it'll get better. And that's not something that ever would have been accepted if this were a male predominant disease, where you look at ACL injuries and the rise of women uh, playing sports and having more ACL injuries, sometimes nine times more frequently, depending on the sport as men. This is an area of ongoing research about how to get women back to playing sports and understanding their joints and their joint safety throughout time. We know that women are also more likely or can suffer from osteoporosis. And this can have really grave consequences, particularly if they fracture a bone such as the hip. And yet we really don't teach women how to strength train and how to make sure that their bone density is protected. So whether it's going all the way back in time and these kind of egregious examples of the ways that our anatomy was depicted, and then the more insidious ways today that we don't understand women's skeletons and don't advocate for women's bone health, it all relates. I'm glad you brought up the frozen shoulder because I had never heard of that before reading your book. And I was also just not aware of how the medical advice on that has changed really recently in just the past decade, right? Exactly, exactly. You talk to orthopedic surgeons and sports medicine doctors throughout history. This was like, well, you know what, ladies, this happens, it'll get better. And it really speaks to this idea that we are meant to suffer, that we are used to suffering, that we tolerate pain better, and we kind of just have to suck it up. But uh, of course we don't. There are definitely treatments that we can do for frozen shoulder. It disproportionately affects postmenopausal women, which is another age bracket where the assumption is, well, you know, you get older, your body stops working as well and kind of, you know, just suck it up because that's what we were told in medicine um, and by society and culture. And, you know, the aging woman is not one that is valued in our society nor properly addressed in our medical system. Only now is that narrative starting to change. But was there anything that particularly surprised you when doing the research for this book? You know, even with your background, was there anything that just seemed wild and caught you off guard? Oh, absolutely. Almost every story of this book <laughs> was wildly shocking to me. Um, the fear and need to control women's sexuality is just... Uh, the stories of these patients and these women is just shocking to me. I think some of the torturous things that women experienced, whether it's having organs removed, like their uterus, their ovaries, their clitoris, or other organs removed uh, because they were deemed crazy, or the lobotomies that were performed in the 1940s to subdue women, or in the 1920s, how there was a famous psychiatrist, Dr. Henry Cotton, who suggested that you know, insanity in women was a function of focal infections, and those infections were likely in the teeth. So the primary treatment for crazy women, and by the way, crazy could be being sent to the asylum for having political views, being sent to the asylum for presumed nymphomania, being sent to the asylum because you simply spoke your mind. You could be admitted to an asylum for anything as a woman. And this was the 1920s. And he uh, went on really a rampage of removing teeth in thousands of women, claiming that he had this 85% cure rate, when in fact, what he was doing is if the teeth didn't work, then he would remove other organs, such as abdominal organs, like the gallbladder or parts of the colon. And in fact, he had a high mortality rate. So women were literally dying because of these disproportionately performed torturous treatments. And I think I was heartbroken and heart sick reading about how recently that was in our history and how that legacy is inherited today. Wow. Yeah. Um, one part that really stuck out to me was your section on bicycles and just how those became demonized when it became more popular for women to ride them. And this like that gave them more mobility and the ability to travel farther from home. So there were stories about how it would deform the female body or like drive her mad. And I think it just really hit home at this idea that a lot of that rhetoric is just about control. Um, can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Because you make it clear that, you know, we're still dealing with a lot of the fallout from this kind of stuff. You know, why does it linger? Well, I think you can see that playing out in our political world right now in terms of how women's bodies and reproductive function and our reproductive health is being threatened and our reproductive agency is being threatened and people wonder where this comes from. 
And oh, you need to look no further than history. It's been baked into the system that our bodies are vessels, our bodies are made for reproduction, that uh, we are unstable. And therefore, you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you're menstruating, you're crazy. And if you're postmenopausal, you're useless. That is what is the narrative uh, throughout history. And, um, you know, I was really shocked just how egregious some of the examples are throughout history. I want to talk a little bit about endometriosis, too, because we've got a number of episodes on that subject coming out in the next few weeks. And I think it kind of falls under the title of All in Her Head very well. Um, for those who are unaware, endometriosis is when there's patches of tissue similar to uterine lining that implant on organs outside the uterus and they, you know, like cramp and bleed with each period. Um, the common estimate out there is that it impacts roughly like one in 10 women, but there's no cure and we still don't really know a whole lot about it. Um, and it could take women years to have their concerns taken seriously and actually get a diagnosis and start going down a path of treatment and stuff like that. Um, I guess my question for you is how can we get a better awareness and knowledge of these conditions? Yeah, it's an excellent question because you're right. There is a large percentage of women that suffer from it, and it is only women. And when you look at these diseases that are uniquely experienced by women, they are woefully underfunded, understudied, and there is a lack of research into exactly what's going on. So first and foremost, we need to start with research and science so that we can figure out how to better help these women. And then it from there translates from the bench, you know, the laboratory bench to the bedside. How do we make clinically meaningful and relevant treatments to women? And that also requires not only the science, but the ability to listen to women. So many women have to suffer with endometriosis for years and years and years because there is this undercurrent of the narrative, well, you know, you're fine and, you know, painful periods are what women experience and you should endure this suffering. And so many women with endometriosis have other urinary symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, systemic bodily issues that are constellation of them, obviously endometriosis, but when taken in isolation can be largely dismissed by the medical system. So we need to train doctors to better listen. And most importantly, we need to make all specialties aware of these diseases that can uniquely affect women, but then just kind of get lumped in a gynecological category. You work primarily with breast cancer patients. How have you seen this play out in your field and impact the patients that you work with? Well, Breast cancer is, as we know, a predominant female disorder, although there are men that are diagnosed with breast cancer every year. But there have been incredible advances in the field of breast cancer where women are living longer and better. But where we really need to play catch up is how we access women living better. Yes, they have many more years to their life. Yes, we are curing more women. But what are the ways that we have not acknowledged the ways that women need to thrive? Uh, I treat a lot of young women and women of all ages and their sexual function and their body image is something that has not been properly addressed throughout the history of medicine. One of the things that we do in treating breast cancer is in many instances, we have to suppress the production of estrogen. And for especially young women, this can mean a rapid decline in estrogen and being thrust into chemical menopause. And yet all of the symptoms that go into that, we tend to think when I say we, the medical establishment is, well, you know, you're alive, you're okay. But um, these women may go from having what they feel is a healthy libido to extremely painful intercourse, loss of libido, depression and anxiety from these symptoms that um, have not historically been addressed. And we're just turning the corner now to say, it's not just about your surviving, but what does it mean for you to thrive in your body as a woman? How do we understand that better? And how do we access that better in our healthcare system? We're speaking with Dr. Elizabeth Komen, oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and author of All in Her Head, The Truth and Lies Early Medicine Taught Us About Women's Bodies and Why It Matters Today. Um, so I guess, you know, like, what should patients do with this kind of information? You know, it sucks that patients should have to fight on things when talking with a doctor, but how can we better advocate for ourselves? I think first and foremost, it's the recognition from all parties involved, the doctor and the patient, is that we are all there with good intentions. You know, for the most part, doctors enter really with this altruistic sense that they want to help the next person. I can speak on behalf of many, many physicians and colleagues that I work with. And yet we are working with a very strained, deeply imperfect and flawed system. And that requires, of course, the burden is not unilaterally on the patient to advocate for themselves, but the advocacy of this sacred relationship becomes very important. As a patient, what can you do? First, it's recognizing 
that it may be very important if you're diagnosed with something new to bring a friend or a family member with you to make sure you have another set of eyes and ears so that you can focus on how you feel and somebody else can focus perhaps on the details and making sure that the questions that you came up ahead of time were discussed. It's about knowing in this complex healthcare system who's on your healthcare team. Uh, apart from the doctor and the patient, you may have a nurse and a nurse practitioner and someone scheduling your appointments as well. Understanding what each of their roles may be is important in your road to advocating for yourself. Number three, there's also this recent Cures Act, which means that you may receive information in your medical chart and like a my chart system before your doctors even had a chance to look at it. You want to clarify with your doctor how you want to receive information because information without context can be terrifying and really scary. I also tell patients, if you don't like your doctor as hard as it is to find another doctor, you got to quit the relationship because if you feel like they don't like you or you don't like them, that's a really, really tough place to be when you need to be vulnerable, you need to be authentic, you need to be trusting in order to be able to say, hey, I'm really afraid of this. This is what's holding me back. This is what's keeping me up at night. Could you explain this better to me? That won't happen if you don't trust your doctor. This might be a broad question, so I hope you don't take it as me being like, give me all the answers to all the world's problems. But, you know, how can we nudge the medical industry as a whole on this or, or help with the culture shift away from gender bias? Because, you know, as you mentioned, a lot of doctors are well-meaning and this is just something that we've all become steeped in. Yeah, it's, of course, not going to happen overnight. When it comes to women's health, there's lots of different ways that we can advocate that. One, if you look at the recent White House initiative for women's health research, it's incredible. There was just a $100 million uh, funding announced devoted towards women's health by Dr. Biden and her team. So I think, uh, one, it's about putting our money where our mouth is and demanding of government, philanthropic, and private sourcing to make sure that we are investing in women's health, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because economically it redounds to our society. There are many studies, some by the um, Women's Health Access Matters Now who commissioned RAND for several studies to show that there is economic benefit, wildly economic benefit to investing in women's health. Um, and so we need to support those companies that are willing to do this important work that's been dismissed for so long. There is the groundswell that's happening among women saying that our health and our bodies matters. That public movement really helps put pressure on the private and the public sector. And then there's the doctors inside, the nurses and the healthcare providers inside the system who can put pressure and saying, you know, we need to figure out how we can carve out time and be valued for what we do so that we can have the best empathy to show up for our patients. And that's just not about women. That's about everybody in society. I think the other thing that we need to put pressure on is insurance companies. There is a lot of money spent in our healthcare system and third-party players can really impact the doctor-patient relationship. You may be frustrated that you're waiting hours to see your doctor and wondering what in the world they could be doing. They could be on the phone with an insurance company speaking to a doctor that has never met you, who just knows nothing about your case, but who is denying you the medicine that you need for your care. And your doctor may be spending hours behind the scenes advocating for what they believe is the right medicine for you. We need to give the healthcare providers the power and the agency and the support to care for patients as they know best and not put that in the hands of people who've never even seen the patient in front of you. Was there a favorite chapter of yours to write? I loved the... Um, nervous system chapter, because my God, how many ways throughout history could we be told that it's all in her head? And I was fascinated by these stories throughout time, whether it was the history of um, the founding of father of neurology, Dr. Charcot, who made so many advances in the field of medicine, but also atrociously put women on display. These women who had sexual trauma, trauma in their childhoods, who he claimed to hypnotize and then would force in front of large audiences to kiss inanimate, inanimate objects, to bark like a dog and to sexualize them in completely inappropriate and disgusting ways. Um, as I said, through lobotomies to the history of Henry Cotton removing women's teeth and organs to these horrible tragic stories of women being thrown into asylum simply for having political beliefs. 
Uh, it was tragic and heartbreaking for me to read about these stories. And I wanted to dignify these women's lives who may never have a voice in history, but we can do a much better job of trying to make sure we don't just dismiss a woman's symptoms today by calling her anxious. We may not be using the same word as hysterical and giving that as a diagnosis, but we still have flavors of that in our healthcare system. And I really appreciated the chance to go back in history and think about how those threads relate to the care today. I really liked the way that you opened the book, too, with skin and plastic surgery. You know, I thought that was a good example of how sometimes it's not about denying women care or telling them that what they're worried about is imaginary or anxiety or all in their head, um, but that it can be about giving women procedures that they're not necessarily asking for or bringing in this pressure for procedures that aren't necessarily needed. Yeah, and I think the history of plastic surgery is really complicated. On the one hand, you have these incredible advances that can give women their sense of self back, like breast implants, which were certainly not invented for breast cancer patients, but now reconstructive techniques can be essential to helping women feel whole again, mm -hmm. to Botox and how that can feel empowering to look in the mirror and not see yourself as wrinkled as you once were. But again, it weaves in this notion of what is women's value? Are we valued primarily for the way that we look? A lot of people would say yes, and that the aging woman does not have the same power in society as the dignified, distinguished, salt and pepper, gray haired man. And those cultural and societal norms and pressures play out in the field of plastic surgery. And in turn, there is this constant push and pull between can plastic surgery treatments be empowering to women? Or can they also reflect punishing beauty standards that can never be met because they're just impossible standards? Well, Dr. Coleman, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, lastly, what do you hope readers most take away from this book? One of the things that really drew me to write this book was the idea that every body has a history. And that's why I felt it was so important for us to include history, our collective history as women throughout the medical care system. My hope is that when women read this book, even though it's about other women, they may see shades or versions of themselves where they've blamed or shamed or been embarrassed about their bodies or afraid to acknowledge what they might be going through or seek the help that they need. My hope is that when they read this book, can they understand the stories that they may have inherited about themselves? Can they understand it a little bit better? And if after reading this book, can they tell themselves a new story about themselves? one that's more empowered, one that allows them to access what they really want from their bodies in health and perhaps in sickness too, because we all are not immune to sickness and illness one day, but that when we do reach that point, is there a way that we can advocate for ourselves better, that we can still find good days even amidst bad things about our health? That is my sincere unwavering hope with this book. Dr. Elizabeth Coleman is an oncologist specializing in breast cancer at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in Manhattan and an assistant professor of medicine at Cornell Medical College. Her new book, Looking at the History of Gender Bias in Early Medicine, is called All in Her Head, The Truth and Lies Early Medicine Taught Us About Women's Bodies and Why It Matters Today. It's out now through Harper Wave at all major booksellers. Dr. Coleman, thanks so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. In New York, all pharmacies can now dispense birth control medications to anyone who wants it, after Governor Kathy Hochul signed a standing order that allows the access. Karen DeWitt with the New York Public News Network brings us more. Governor Hochul says it's another step to protect women's reproductive rights after the U.S. Supreme Court's Dobbs decision in 2022 that struck down the landmark abortion rights decision Roe v. Wade. Hochul says Dobbs emboldened some on the political right to try to limit medication abortions and in vitro fertilization. While birth control medicines remain legal in the U.S., some states are placing restrictions on obtaining the pills or contraceptive devices. The governor says in New York there will be full access. Starting today, pharmacies are now allowed to dispense three different types of contraception medication, 
and any woman can walk into a participating pharmacy and choose the birth control method that best suits her needs. And this will dramatically, dramatically increase access to this for women, particularly at a time when women are feeling discouraged and not listened to and powerless. State Health Commissioner Jim McDonald says three methods of contraception will be available. The oral hormonal pill, conventionally known as the birth control pill, a hormonal vaginal ring, and a hormonal contraceptive patch. McDonald says the order signed by the governor essentially gives the health commissioner the power to issue one prescription that can be accessed by anyone. Basically what we've done today by me signing this order is if you come to New York and you want to have contraception, I've issued a prescription for you. For this role, I've become your doctor as the state's physician. He says the pharmacists will do a risk assessment to help the person decide which method is best for them. All the prescriptions will be covered by insurance. People from other states can get the birth control medicines and devices, too, as long as they are physically in a pharmacy in New York, McDonald says. The way it works if you're out of state is you walk into a New York State pharmacy, show them your insurance card, and just say to the pharmacist, hey, I'm here to see what I can do as far as getting contraception. You're welcome like everyone else. He says everyone who asks can get a year's worth of the medication. The law was supposed to go into effect in January, but Hochul says the state education department needed more time to finalize the regulations. The major chain pharmacies and many independent drugstores are expected to participate. In Albany, I'm Karen DeWitt for the New York Public News Network. Finally, being able to remain calm in a high-stress situation takes a lot of practice. At Hudson Valley Community College in Troy, New York, health students recently got the opportunity to train for a range of emergency scenarios and ask questions before facing life-or-death situations in the real world. WAMC's Lucas Willard gives us a glimpse of their experience. Health sciences students from a variety of disciplines filled HVCC's cardiorespiratory and emergency medicine department for a day of events designed to test their medical know-how, communication, and cooperation skills. Inside a simulated emergency room, students debrief after a scenario involving an infant burn victim, a life-size dummy with gauze taped to its head and a tube in its mouth is lying on an exam table. Serenity Tata was among nursing students taking part in the simulation. So we were told there was a fire, so then I we would we were taught like, okay, this is a burn victim. What are the most important priorities for a burn victim, such as airway, make sure the airway is patent, we want to cover the burns, start fluids, and basically protect their vitals. In this scenario, the baby did not survive. Cleopatra Coppola, a first-year mortuary science student, placed the infant wrapped in a blanket into a zippered bag. In class, we actually do live embalmings. Here, it's more of how to prepare the body to take to the morgue or to the funeral home. So this is new for me, but it's really interesting to actually be able to like lift the body up and see what it's before we get to the embalming room. Lori Q. Purcell chairs the Mortuary Science Department at HVCC and says participating in the scenarios is an accreditation requirement for seniors in the program. So it actually what happens is each year they, we've done this simulation. So the students in every department, but our mortuary students, they're actually, when this baby had deceased, they would now talk with a family to get information and then the, the, the deceased would be taken either to the funeral home, maybe, you know, depending where it would go. In the scenario involving the infant burn victim, volunteer Connie Hosler acted as the baby's mother. I'm very impressed in how they uh, treat you as a, a parent, like what they've said to me, how they've comforted me, and that kind of thing. I'm really surprised because they're young and they're learning, but they're very good at what they're, what they're doing, I think. The simulations run the length of the day. During an afternoon break, a group debriefing is held in a large conference room. Nursing instructor Sarah Konak leads the discussion. Right, you all kept asking me, where's the mom? You should have asked EMS, right? Though, so things like that have started to come up. So be mindful of those. Those are questions that we have to make Konak sure. Konak says the simulations are meant to be treated by students as a professional hospital setting. She critiques the students' use of language and ability to gather information. 
if there's room for opportunities, those are the safe place to make those errors because we really want them to learn. That needs to be the safe place. They need to be able to make, you know, um, have that safe place to learn, have that safe place to ask questions so that they can see those, see one, do one, teach one type of thing, and then move on to the real clinical setting where they have real live patients. And they've seen those scenarios before, so they can connect those dots on, oh, I've seen this. This is kind of how this should play out, and this is kind of how I should handle the situation. More than 100 HVCC students participated alongside staff and physicians from Albany Medical Center. For WAMC News, I'm Lucas Willard. Thanks for listening to this week's 51%. 51% is a national production of WAMC Northeast Public Radio in Albany, New York. It's produced and hosted by me, Jesse King. Our associate producer is Jody Cowan, and our theme is Lolita by the Albany-based artist Girl Blue. Just a reminder that you can listen to 51% anytime at our website, wamcpodcast.org, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can stay in the loop on all of WAMC shows by signing up for our weekly newsletter, Airwaves, at wamc.org. We hope you'll join us next week. Until then, I'm Jesse King for 51%. I was every single girl. I was nobody else. I was so sure of myself. I was 15 and a half. He was a hollow laugh. And I lost my cool somewhere along the way. The night bed on the hall. Take it. Sit down.